But I come to you from Washington where, let's face it, what really matters? Who gets what job, right? You know, that's, that's really what we care about. Uh, there's an old saying, uh, in fact, in Russia, where I spent four years with my husband, as, as Nancy mentioned, uh, goes back to the Soviet times. The cadres decide everything. Uh, and of course, this was true not just in Moscow, but in Washington as well. Uh, who gets what job? It's a blood sport. And it's a blood sport, by the way, that really does matter. Uh, so what's the Washington betting line now that Rice is out? Well, for starters, I have to tell you, it's looking like we just might be able to entitle uh, Obama's second term the revenge of the white guys. I can't say for sure, uh, and anybody who tells you they can is just lying. Uh, so I can't tell you for sure who it is who's going to get these national security jobs in the second term. But look at who the names are that we're now talking about for some of these big jobs. John Kerry for Secretary of State former Republican Senator uh, Chuck Hagel for de uh, Defense Secretary. That was reported today uh, by Bloomberg News. White House aide John Brennan for the CIA. Uh, it's ironic, but just a few weeks ago, uh, we were asking on Foreign Policy's website, is America really ready for a white male Secretary of State? <laughs> But, you know, I have to tell you, the answer just might turn out to be yes, and a whole lot white more, a whole lot more white males where that came from. Uh, so we'll, we'll have to see. And, you know, again, I'm not selling you the Brooklyn Bridge. I can't tell you for sure who's going to get these jobs. But it certainly looks like Obama is considering what amounts to a very experienced, a very qualified, uh, a very capable group of white men who also are likely to win Senate confirmation, which clearly is a top priority these days. But, of course, Washington needs policies, not just policy makers. Uh, and on that score, surprisingly, there's been much less than you would expect uh, when it comes to those knowledgeable about what it is that Obama has planned for the second term. You'd be forgiven if you missed that part of the 2012 campaign. You know, the part where he spelled out exactly in great detail what he was going to be doing? I know. It just wasn't there. Unless, of course, uh, killing Osama bin Laden counts as a second term program as well as a first term program. <laughs> so what do we know about Obama's second term program when it comes to, you know, the whole rest of the world that doesn't involve the fiscal cliff? Well, of course, we do know some things. It's not exactly like it's a blank slate that we're facing. And first and foremost, of course, is his pledge to withdraw American troops from Afghanistan uh, by the end of 2014. And this, of course, is something that, if he could, my sense is he would do it even sooner. And in reality, this is now supported across a very broad swath of the American political spectrum. And there's a reason that uh, Mitt Romney in that third debate uh, suddenly changed his position and was all of a sudden agreeing with Barack Obama that he too would be looking for the exits in Afghanistan. So that's a pretty big agenda item and it's one that's going to come with a lot of challenges. It's not something that was talked about a lot in the campaign, but the bottom line is there are nearly 70,000 U.S. troops still in Afghanistan today. Getting them out of there with the uncertainties of a political transition that will also see Hamid Karzai slated to leave office in 2014 and no obvious successor whatsoever to him, it's going to be a tall order just for Obama to figure out a way to fulfill that campaign pledge. What else is on his docket? Well, reduce our defense budget. With or without the fiscal cliff, with or without sequestration, you are looking at the possibility of very real cuts uh, to an American military that has grown used to 10 years of ever expanding budgets. And I do imagine that you're going to see a battle royale one way or the other, not just with Republicans and Democrats, by the way, on Capitol Hill who don't want to see further cuts, but a big debate within the Pentagon and within the Obama administration about what are the right kind of cuts to make. What kind of military do we need uh, to fight the wars of the post post 9-11 era? We're just busy still extricating ourselves from two battles, uh, classic counterinsurgency campaigns, what are the conflicts we're going to face in the future, and therefore what kind of military do we need to be building even as we're cutting back on the military that we have been building over the last 10 years. There are definitely unknown unknowns, uh, but there are a lot of known unknowns as well. Uh, we might be thinking about Syria and what we should be doing uh, to end the 
slaughter there that has led more than 40,000 people to be killed so far. But think about the crises that aren't hitting your front pages right now. The rise of Al-Qaeda in the Sahel and the creation of a new refuge and safe haven uh, for jihadist groups in the failed state of Mali. A place, by the way, that just until about a year ago was hailed as a model of uh, African democracy. Think about the prospects of further state collapse in the Middle East. Forget about the front page stories that we're talking about in the Middle East. What happens uh, when even more unstable regimes uh, totter or create political chaos in the region? What if there's another political transition in Saudi Arabia where the king isn't looking all too good these days? And by the way, the next in line for the throne is yet another uh, octogenarian brother. Uh, so that, you know, there, we're looking at the potential for long-term disruption in Saudi Arabia. Or Jordan, as I mentioned, where uh, thousands and thousands of protesters in the streets and where the monarchy has been a reliable ally of the United States but may be increasingly untenable as uh, unrest spreads throughout the region. Based on one of the most conservative and nationalistic Russian thinkers of the 19th century, the idea that there is a unique Russian civilization that needs to be nurtured um, and promoted. We've seen the eviction of foreign nonprofits. Is this part of a movement? No question that it's part of the playbook uh, for Vladimir Putin that when challenged, as he has been very dramatically over the last year, nationalism is going to come into play. And it's, it's a very potent force in Russian political life. And it, and it goes back all the way to the 19th century, where there was really a raging debate in, in Tsarist Russia between those who looked to the West for inspiration, those who thought that they needed to Im import, uh, perhaps not full-scale democracy, which was many, many decades later in coming, but at least the uh, tools, techniques, and philosophy of Enlightenment Europe versus those Russians who identified themselves as Slavophiles and believed that uh, Russia's path was its own. It was uh, unique and that it really would pursue its own course of development. The world in 2013 looks pretty precarious for the U.S. Do you see any positive changes for the U.S., a strengthening of alliances? All right, you know, optimism is not lost on the young, hopefully. Uh, <laughs> You know, it, it's interesting. I, I think in many ways that uh, there are many uh, optimistic developments that we can see right now. I talked about a few of them uh, in this speech. For example, the growth of a global middle class, uh, which is good news not only for the literally billions of people being lifted out of poverty, but certainly it's good news for the global economy. Uh, and I think more generally, you do have the prospects of this North American energy boom, uh, which is in many ways one of the most unlikely things we thought we'd ever be talking about uh, just a, a few years ago. Uh, there's the technological revolution, which is transforming not only our lives, but certainly is transforming geopolitics as well. These are all fairly optimistic developments. If there were to be a deal uh, and the fiscal cliff avoided. I think there are better prospects for U.S. economic growth than there were uh, just over the last couple years. So, you know, I, I think there are a lot of positive developments. And I think it's been interesting to watch the arc of our national angst over the rise of China and what does it tell us. And, re and remember, we've been through these cycles before. In the 1980s, it, we were obsessed with a rising Japan. Uh, you know, and, and look how that turned out. We with the hope of the Arab Spring and then the recent violence and unrest, how do you feel about the prospects for a new U.S. relationship with the region? Well, let's just say that, uh, you know, some of our heady optimism of the early days of 2011 has, has faded, understandably, when colliding with the, the real reality of having to build, almost from scratch, new institutions of politics, of governance, and of civil society in, in some of the worst governed countries in the world over the last few decades. And by the way, it's, it's a region of the world where America doesn't always face up to this, but we have a pretty miserable record 
uh, of supporting some pretty awful tyrants. And these were folks who might have been reliable guarantors of American interests when it came to the global competition with the Soviet Union, but when it came to their own people, uh, we were not on the side of the good guys. And so washing away that legacy in the Middle East, creating a new and much more solid foundation for a relationship with a democratic publics in these countries uh, is very, very early days. And frankly, we haven't seemed uh, to really know what our policy is when it comes to some of those countries. I would like you to give your perspective on your editorial choices in the magazine Foreign Policy since you've become editor and the development of the daily website. Well, thank you. And I promise I did not actually plant that question. So, uh, But thank you very much. Uh, you know, foreign policy, uh, both the subject and uh, the magazine, has been a very fun project. And, you know, we started out uh, about four years ago in, in an effort to rethink and to remake this uh, for a new, more digital era. And while we were doing it, we, we had a little bit of a slogan around the office, sort of a joke. We said, you know, the world is not a boring place. Right, so you know, why should your reading about it be? Well, we kind of came to really like and embrace that slogan, so we turned it from from a joke into our actual slogan. And I think it it, it suggests that you know there's a lot more stakeholders in the world today, and there's a lot more ways and vantage points to view the world. And also, if you want to shape the conversation about the world around you, well, guess what? First of all, you need to participate in it. And we have these amazing new tools to do that. How do security concerns limit journalists today? You know, this is a really important question. Uh, you know, I, here I am talking in, in a very optimistic and bullish way about the opportunities for journalists around the world. But the truth is, our need for getting up close in and in, in, into the middle of the story puts people at great risk and um, I think it's a bigger and bigger challenge. I look at coverage of the, the war in Syria where, where a number of journalists have been killed uh, while trying to bring the story out to a world that has been otherwise all too indifferent. Marie Colvin, who was one of the great correspondents of her time. Uh, my friend and colleague, Anthony Shadid, who, who died while uh, attempting to go in on horseback uh, into an otherwise inaccessible conflict.